California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you're cornered and need confidential help, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. Dear Mr. Valentine, I've loved a man now for many years, a hopeless love, because you see, I'm his wife's best friend. He says we must be together at all costs, and I know that would almost certainly mean her death. I couldn't build any kind of happiness on that. I have an answer, but I need your help to carry on. I need your help to carry it out. Could you be at my apartment tomorrow morning? Signed, Joyce Dunning. Husband, wife, best friend. The time-worn triangle, Brooksy. Yes, but something new's been added, darling. Mm. Oh, you mean the oversensitive conscience? Mm-hmm. The superfluous member of the triangle doesn't, as a rule, get such consideration. <laughs> especially from the rival female in the case. I wonder if Miss Dunning's reference to death could be a refined way of hinting at murder. Oh, some women have been known to just turn their backs and let mayhem happen. Oh, oh now you're being cynical, Angel. No, dear. I've just spent a lot of time in powder room. Oh, well, anyway, our friend has her own answer, and I seem to fit into it. I hope that isn't a refined way of saying, welcome, sucker. Yes, Mr. Valentine, you're in love with me. Like it? I am. He is. It's obvious to everybody. Your every action must show it. Oh, now, just a minute, Well, oh, don't Dunning. you see? It's the only way. I've got to make Lawrence despise me. Uh, Miss Dunning, I'll admit Mr. Valentine has certain qualities that might arouse jealousy in other men. Thank you. But uh, just why are you going to go into all this trouble? As a stand-in Romeo and potential punching bag for your Lawrence, I'd like to know that, too. Lawrence Putnam isn't an easy man to convince. That's why it must look like the real thing between you and me. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Did you say Putnam? Oh, yes. I suppose you've heard of him. Oh, yeah. Lawrence and Bernice Putnam in deepest Africa, in fabulous Somaliland, in timeless Tibet. <laughs> Lawrence and Bernice Putnam, one of the ideally mated couples of our time, sharing adventure and romance side by side. But he loves me. And for years I've fought against my love for him. But it's there. And, uh, Bernice Putnam? She doesn't know. And she mustn't know, ever. Well, she doesn't sound like the kind of female who'd keel over when she found out her husband had fallen in love with another woman. If she found out, it would mean her death. What? Yeah, you mentioned that in your letter, Miss Dunning. Now, what's it supposed to mean? Bernice's heart. Dr. Llewellyn, the family physician, told Lawrence a few weeks ago just how bad it is. I see. Almost any kind of exertion or shock might mean... Anyway, you can imagine what would happen if Lawrence told her he wanted to be free to marry me. Uh-huh. And you think that if you and I were seen going places and doing things, people would say we're in love, especially Lawrence. I am Bernice's best friend. And she needs Lawrence now, even more than I do. Dr. Llewellyn says that if she's to go on living, they've got to go away and settle down in some quiet place, you know, on a farm or a small town. Well, not a very easy change for either one of them. Bernice knows she has to do it, and she's positive Lawrence loves her enough to go along with her. If it's the last thing I do, I've got to make it work out that way. Well, have you tried breaking off with Putnam? Women usually know how to imply. I've I'm tried sure. everything. Lawrence just thinks I'm being noble about Bernice. That's why I've got to make him believe there's someone else. Well, now look, this deal, Miss Dunning, it's way out you of my line. You can't turn me down, Mr. Valentine. It means her life. Well, I... You understand, don't you, Miss Brooks? Yes, I believe I do. You're trying to do a pretty decent thing. <sighs> okay, well, how do we work this? Well... Tonight, for instance. Yeah? Lawrence is meeting a circus man for dinner at the Croydon. He's selling some of the animals from his last expedition. He keeps them on his estate at Mount Webster. And? Lawrence doesn't think I know about the appointment. So if he saw us there, and we were playing our parts, it might help bring this thing to the head. Convince him that I'm, I'm only thinking of myself. Okay, Miss Dunning, okay. But as I said before, this is something new for me, so I may need a little coaching. But I'll keep Tyrone Power in mind and do my best. <laughs> hey, 
everybody else but Putnam seems to be noticing us. When Lawrence gets on the subject of that menagerie he has on his estate, he, he doesn't notice anything around him. Well, we're certainly playing the romantic couple to the health. Your tiny hand in mine, rapturous glances by candlelight. You know, all we need is a gypsy violinist at our table playing Zagonia. I never thought anything could hurt so much. Oh, I'm sorry, Joyce. Dr. Llewellyn told Lawrence he has to get Bernice away in a matter of days. This has to work. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What? Don't look over, but I think he spotted us. Uh, darling? Oh. oh, George. We should at least pretend we're interested in all this lovely food. All of the waiter thing. Well, <laughs> he's had a good look at you, hasn't he? Oh, oh I think you'll forgive me. You are beautiful tonight, George. Oh, if I hadn't told you just a few minutes ago how much I loved you, I'd say it again. Why don't you, George? What? Uh, Lawrence, I... Well, what does one say in a situation like this? What a coincidence or fancy meeting you here? <laughs> oh, uh, Joyce, darling, I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Oh, uh, Lawrence, this is... I was just having a most interesting discussion with Mr. Folsom, my guest, but, uh, well, I just had to come over and pay my respects. Well, I, I hardly expected to see you here. But, Lawrence, I did try to tell you before, in so many ways... Great I... animal man, Folsom. We were talking about living in the jungle, which isn't too unlike civilization. Uh, for instance, when you're on a safari, you have to trust whoever is with you, blindly, without reservation. Lawrence. A betrayal of trust is the one thing you can't tolerate. Your well-being, your comfort and happiness, your, your very survival depends on that rather primitive law. So you, you do something about it. Well, that's a rather grim conversation for such pleasant surroundings. Uh, look, we'd, we'd like to ask you and your friend to join us, but, uh, well, you understand. Perfectly. Good night, Joyce. Oh, but Lawrence, I... Easy, Joyce. Hold that smile. Yes. Yes, you're right. Well, we put on a nice act, but I doubt if it's the old convincer. It's pretty obvious Putnam isn't letting it go at that. Miss Brooks, I believe? Why, yes, but Mr. Valentine isn't here. I know. I made sure of that. What? I waited uh, till I saw him leave the building. Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand. I'm Lawrence Putnam. Oh, yes, of course. I should have recognized you from your picture. Miss Brooks, how much is Joyce Dunning paying Valentine to help her stage this phony romance? What are you talking about? Please, please. I, I've taken the trouble to find out all about Valentine and this... Uh, Unorthodox business he's in. What? Yes, yes, and I've also learned that he's not just your boss. He means a great deal more to you than that. I don't see where that's any of your business. Everything about Valentine is my business now. Oh, I... I'm sorry. George might have meant something to me once, but in the last few weeks all that's changed. Oh? I don't know where he met Miss Dunning, but I know he hasn't been the same man since. All he can think of is when he's going to see her next. Well, I don't care what he does now. I have my pride. Mm. Hmm. Maybe I had this thing lined up wrong at that. All right. You're interested in Valentine. I'm interested in Miss Dunning. Suppose we work together. Oh, I'd be willing to do almost anything. Good. Now, why don't you tell Valentine that I feel very bad about my rudeness at the Croydon last evening? I'd like him and George to spend the weekend at our place on Mount Webster. And uh, while I was here, I suggested that you come along, too. Oh, but wouldn't that be rather awkward? Well, why? After all, we don't live in the jungle. We're, we're civilized people, and Mrs. Putnam and Joyce are very close friends. And you and Mr. Valentine both having the same interests. <laughs> yes. Yes, it should be a very pleasant weekend. Come Monday morning, we should all know just where we stand. Bernice, are you sure it isn't too cold for you out here on the terrace? Oh, now, Joyce, you stop pampering me. I have all I can do to put up with Lawrence and Dr. Llewellyn, the old tyrant. Well, that's hardly fair, Mrs. Putnam. After all, they aren't here to defend themselves. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Putnam, the view from up here is breathtaking. Yes, it is lovely. No matter what forsaken part of the world we might have been in, this was always home. 
Although some people refer to it as the Putnam Zoo. It's not easy for Lawrence to be giving it all up. Oh? Then he has decided. Yes. He's selling some of the animals to services and others to zoos. Then we'll... We'll just be two homebodies. Oh, but this couldn't possibly interest Mr. Valentine and Miss Brooks. Oh, here comes Lawrence and Dr. Llewellyn. Oh, uh, time for your nap, Bernice, and no wheedling out of it. He's right, my dear. Do you see what I mean by the thin line between thoughtfulness and tyranny? <laughs> <laughs> Come along, Bernice. I'll go with you. Uh, Dr. Llewellyn has me billeted in Lawrence's study on the ground floor. I don't have to climb stairs. But whenever I wake up, it's so big, I feel as though I'm sleeping in the middle of a gymnasium. <laughs> I think I'll curl up with a good book while the gentlemen pay tribute to the animal kingdom. Oh, yes, Lawrence. Mr. Valentine made the fatal remark. He'd like to look around. Give him the special dollar to it. I'll do that, Bernice. I uh, think you might learn a lot from this little tour, Valentine. Come along. This way. Okay. Mm. Uh, I could never understand anybody living in the middle of a zoological garden. Not only the infernal noise, but, uh, well, the odors. Say, in that case, what are those birds? Parakeets, Valentine. Probably the most beautiful ever brought into this country. Oh, this is nothing. On the other side of the hill, he actually has cheetahs, jaguars, and, and, and crocodiles. <laughs> you don't say. Oh, here, here. Here's something for you to see, Valentine. What's that? Here in this big cage. A bird that very few people know anything about. Wow. He's an ugly character. Looks like a buzzard or a vulture. Mm. Ah! Yes. Ah! yes. Uh. The condor. The killer bird of the Andes. Good. Oh, uh, Juan! Si, senor. Open the cage, Juan. Tomorrow, maybe, senor. Tonight he has very bad temper. He looks harmless enough. <laughs> well, don't let appearances fool you. Those wings can spread more than ten feet. The talons are larger than your hand. <laughs> You know, I've seen how condors lie in wait for a pack train or a herd of cattle. They single one victim out, blind it with their claws, and go at it even before it's dead. Yes, they can eat 18 pounds of meat in one day. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> the facts you don't learn in a movie travelogue. Huh? Uh, let me have that machete one. Now, this is the only thing as sharp as his talons, Valentine. I, uh... I made him learn to respect it. You must not go in tonight, Senor Putnam. Uh, look here, Lawrence. I, I thought you were going to sell all these things and give up all this nonsense, hmm? Llewellyn, I'm not the invalid. Oh, uh, yes, but... Uh, Perhaps I... you'd like to join me, Valentine. It'll be an experience. Oh, yeah, sure, I bet. But, uh, frankly, I could live without it. Oh, it'll be quite safe. Now, uh, this condor hates me. But that, that's only because he fears me. You'll be safe, unless, of course, your taste runs to uh, parakeets or canaries. Okay, Putnam, I'll play along. As long as you say it's safe. Well, I'll stay here, but uh, really, Lawrence, you shouldn't. Ah, ah. Look at that condor, Valentine. Isn't it a beauty? <coughs> uh, he's beginning to spread his wings. Ah, you're up to something, aren't you, you beady eyed mud? <coughs> Watch him. He's coming at me. He is like the devil. He's coming at me. Hey, Putnam, Putnam, don't stand there. Putnam, wait. Get away from me. All right, get back. Get back. That's enough. I'll kill you if you weren't worth so much. Hurry, senores. Come out quick. Are you all right, Lawrence? Yeah, yeah, he's all right. And I'm all right, too. Well, you were correct, Putnam. That was an experience. You know, a condor is a strange creature, Valentine. This is his cage, and he resents it when somebody threatens what he's claimed for his own. That was pretty obvious. And he doesn't know what it means to fight clean. You can understand that, can't you? Yes, Putnam, I can. And don't you worry. I'm not going to forget it. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about a summer motoring precaution. If you're planning a trip, better get those worn tires inspected tomorrow at an independent Chevron gas station or a standard station. That's where you'll find your best value, Atlas Tires. Famous for giving more mileage and safer mileage. 
Besides having more rubber to grip the road and a road-tested design for safer stops, Atlas tires give you greater riding comfort, too. And each new Atlas passenger tire is backed by a written warranty. For a whole year, this warranty covers damage to the tire from ordinary road hazards and guarantees the materials and workmanship for the life of the tire. Best of all, your Atlas tire warranty is honored by 38,000 dealers, coast to coast and in Canada. For safer, better driving, go on Atlas tires. And for expert tire care, rely on standard stations and independent Chevron gas stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. And if you were in George's place, here's the situation you'd be facing. A lady asks you to help break off a hopeless love between her and the husband of her best friend. Pretty corny, you say. But then she explains that the wife has a heart condition. The shock would most certainly kill her. So you pretend to be the man who supplanted the husband in your client's affections. But then there's a thinly veiled threat from the husband. He won't hesitate to kill you if you stand in his way. Still, being as stubborn a character as George Valentine, you play along even though you can't help asking certain questions, such as... Hey, Putnam, isn't this a lot of trouble to climb all the way to the summer house just for a cup of tea? Oh, it'll be worth it, Valentine. From the upper terrace, you can look down and see all the trophies of a lifetime. Birds and animals you've risked your life to find in every corner of the world. Oh, take it easy, Lawrence. It's a steep climb, and there's not that much of a hurry. Uh, Dr. Llewellyn, oh. this has been my whole life. This one last look, before I give it all up, means a great deal to me. Are you all right, Bernice? Yes, dear, fine. Joyce and Miss Brooks said they'd have tea already when we get there. And Joyce promises a special surprise. wonder what it could be. What's the matter with you people? Tea's getting cold. Yeah, we're coming, Brooksy. <laughs> you set the table up right out here on the porch. Oh, it's beautiful, Joyce. And all these flowers. Why, this must be an occasion. <laughs> it is. Please, Miss Brooks, will you help me serve? Of course. <laughs> I feel like a romantic schoolgirl. Uh-huh. But I know you've already guessed, Bernice. And the rest of you will find out anyway. Yes, Joyce? I'll never know how it really happened. Just what is it that makes two people suddenly realize they're in love, George? You... Oh, I, I suppose you just call it the sweet mystery of life or something like that. What I'm trying to say, everybody, is that... George and I are engaged to be married. <laughs> Lawrence! Uh, I'm just not used to such world-shaking announcements. I'm sorry. Um, let me be the first to congratulate you both. Oh, thank you, Brooksy. I don't know how much you mean it. Uh, my best wishes, of course. Well, isn't it wonderful, Lawrence? Just the thing we've always wanted for Joyce. Yes. Lawrence, where are you going? What's the matter? Lawrence! <laughs> Lawrence, you shouldn't have left us like that. Bernice couldn't understand the way you acted. She's back at the house with Dr. Llewellyn. And you find me in the snake house, Joyce. Very appropriate. It seems I have a morbid fascination for things that crawl and are likely to strike without warning. Lawrence, don't. Look, Portland, let's stop kidding each other. I know how you feel about Joyce. She told me. Really? But we love each other. That's the way it turned out. And there's nothing that can be done about it. That's right, Mr. Putnam. I'm a sort of casualty in this little drama, too. Please try to understand, Lawrence. Of course, dear. As long as I'm sure it's the real thing between you and Valentine, I... I'm sorry. Well, let's forget about it, huh? Oh, sure, sure. But now you must... You must really allow me to play the gracious host. What do you mean, Mr. Putnam? I'm going to show you my rarest prize. I think you ought to go and talk to Bernice. Bernice would want you to see it. The King Cobra... We trapped it together in the Nepal just last year. Oh, how, how nice. The pale killer. That's what the natives called it. The color almost white. The only time you could hope to capture it was at night when there was no moon. Uh, he, uh, he's over here in this cage. Come over and take a look at him. You'll never get another chance. They're coming for him the first thing in the morning. You know, George, I could skip this. He's playing some kind of a game, Brooksy. I've got to find out what it is. Lawrence, you've showed me that cobra before. You can tell the others about it. Why do we have to look at it tonight? Because it's the best time, my dear. Uh, wait, wait a minute. What's the matter? Why, he's he's not in there. Or, huh? or is he? Hey, Putnam, close that door. No, he's not in there. Juan! Juan! Where are you? Oh, if he let them take him away tonight before I had a chance to see him, I... I... Well, 
We'll just have to go through life without seeing the pale killer. It's tough, but we'll have to bear up under it. Let's get back to the house, George. Yes, I'm worried about the niece. Let's go. George! What is it? There! He's out of the cage! The cobra! Ah. He's coming toward us! Brooksy, out of the way! Run for the door! George. What's I say, Brooksy? He, he's coming toward me! Now, get back, Joyce. He's raising up the strike. Oh, be careful! Look, stand behind me. I'll try to hold him off with this rake. It's a snap lock. I can't open the door! George, he struck your leg! I got him pinned down! But... But he bit you. I saw him. Right. Keep pounding on that door, Brooksy. Somebody's got to hear us. Get us out of here. Uh, it's about time you saw up, Lawrence. This man might die. Don't just stand there like that. Lawrence, you certainly must have an antidote for something like this. But there's really no need for all this excitement. Why what? do you think so? Well, but how can you talk like that? Can't you see? What are you saying? I thought I mentioned it, Miss Brooks. We had the poison sacks of that cobra removed. Oh, he'd, oh, he'd be okay. much too dead to have around otherwise. Well, I guess you could stop pampering me now and I can get up. Yes, I'm sorry about this, Valentine. I, I could have sworn the cage was empty. That cobra must have been coiled up in a dark corner. Uh-huh. I heard all the commotion in the snake house. When I looked in, I saw you, Valentine, get Miss Brooks out of danger and then go to Joyce's rescue. You saw all that? But why didn't you do something? Yes, Lawrence. As I said, I thought I told you the snake was harmless. I, uh, I did open the door as quickly as I could. Yeah. Oh, thanks. you could have saved us all a lot of worry if you weren't more concerned about getting that cobra back in his cage. <laughs> well, it's all over now, Doctor, and the best thing for all of us would be to turn in. Oh, uh, oh, yes, Doctor. Mm. On the way to my room, shall I stop in and give Bernice those pills for her heart? Uh, I, I've done that, Lawrence. Uh, she's probably fast asleep. Oh, it's a good thing, too, considering all this excitement. Mr. Putnam, I suppose this little incident should make a chapter in the next book you write. Well, you may have something there, Valentine. It, it was quite an experience. The kind of experience we learn a lot from, whether we realize it or not. <laughs> Okay, Brooksy, when I'm through with my cigarette, we'll get back to the house. It's getting late. George, I'm afraid. Oh, no, no, Angel. Well, he's such a strange man. I can't tell what he might be up to next. Well, one thing you can be sure of, he doesn't believe that gag about me and Joyce anymore. No, he planned that little job in the snake house, and it worked. Oh, I can't explain how I felt, George, when I saw that the only thing you could think of at that moment was me. Putnam saw what he wanted to see, all right. That I wasn't thinking of the woman I was supposed to marry... Mm -hmm. Well, now that he knows, it doesn't seem much use to go on with this farce. And I'm wondering about something else. What, Donnie? Now that Putman knows that Joyce went to all this trouble of hiring me because she loves him so much, what is he going to do about Bernice? Is he still going to give up Joyce and all the excitement in his life for a quiet place in the country? And Bernice is so sure he loves her enough to do anything for her. Yeah, no. I don't know. Maybe my brains are parted the wrong way, Brooksy, but I keep feeling that there's something even screwier about this deal. I mean, even more cockeyed than anything that's happened to us today. Oh, it's just a feeling you get around this place. But maybe it was worth it. Huh? What do you mean? Oh, look, you big dope. What makes it so hard for you to say you love me? It's much easier than pushing me out of the way of cobras. <laughs> oh, Angel, there are things you don't have to put into words. Now, you know... <laughs> Well, that's coming from the house. It's burning. Oh, and I don't know how it got loose. That's the condor. Lawrence! Lawrence, don't go so near him. Watch your eyes. I thought I taught you to fear me. Bernie, Bernie, get into the house. So you found the condor when you escaped. Hey, Lawrence, look out. Don't try to fight him. And your hate even had you right to my room, didn't it? Putnam. Putnam, don't be a fool. You can't fight this thing off of the chair. Stay out of my way, Valentine. I've listened to you enough today. This is the only way to handle a car like this. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. Now we know what a dead condor looks like. Oh, God. Look, go on over and take care of her niece. Yes, George, I'll get Dr. Llewellyn the shot. What in heaven's name is... Yes, what's Sorry. happened? Fortunately, nothing, Joyce. That bird never had the chance to touch him. But Dr. Llewellyn, George, Lawrence, on the floor like that. Huh? Oh, Lawrence, oh, my darling. But I told you, the bird never got to him. Bernice, Lawrence is dead. What's that? Oh. 
can't now. He was trying to save me. But how, oh, Dr. Dr. Llewellyn? Why? Uh, I guess all our deception didn't work, Bernice. Deception? What do you mean, Doctor? Uh, we knew Lawrence would never give up the kind of life he wanted and needed, not for himself. He would do it for Bernice. Dr. Yes, uh, you see, it was uh, Lawrence whose heart was so bad. But, George, you and I know that what happened was no accident. Putnam was in that room to save Bernice. That's right, Brooksy. And he was hoping the shock of waking up in a room with a condor would be enough to finish off his wife. And then he'd be free to marry Joyce. And with no murder charge to worry about. Bill Angel, our record of this case is going to agree exactly with Dr. Llewellyn's heart failure. Well, I guess you're right. It'd be too cruel to tell Bernice or Joyce the real truth. Hey, you know, now I know what that feeling was I had when we were walking back toward the house. Dr. Llewellyn always worried about Putnam overexerting himself, like in the condor cage. That's right, of course. For the sake of appearances, Dr. Llewellyn had Bernice take the room downstairs so she wouldn't have to traipse up and down. But he didn't have anything to say when she climbed all the way up that steep hill for our engagement party. Well, if he was setting a trap for an animal in the jungle, he couldn't have done better than what he had in mind for his wife. Yeah. I suppose there's a certain poetic justice, Angel. The perfect trap caught the perfect hunter. <laughs> Maybe you've run into the kind of motorist who always says, Grease is grease, and it doesn't matter where you take your car for lubrication service. Well, don't you believe him. At independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations, they use many specialized grades of RPM greases and oils to give your car a thorough lubrication. And each one is tailor-made to do a wear-saving job at some vital wear point on your car. The regular 1,000-mile grease job at these stations is done by trained experts. They follow a lube chart approved by the manufacturer of your car. And they take pride in doing a spick-and-span clean job for you. Next time your car is due for lubrication service, rely on the standard station or the independent Chevron gas station, where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear George saying... Take another look down the highway, Brooksy. What do you say? A pretty highway. Yeah. One lane going east, the other going west. Uh-huh. And an island of trees in the middle. Yeah. Joe Logan left this place and started to walk down the highway on the right-hand side, walking toward the Half Moon Motel, not away from it. Well, if you're right, George, Logan never even got there to kill Potter. Which should simplify things for us, but it doesn't. I've got a hunch whoever killed Potter ran Logan down. And, Brooksy... That's what we've got to find out. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gene Bates as Joyce Dunning, Ted Van Elts as Lawrence Putnam, Dorothy Lovett as Bernice Putnam, Herbert Rawlinson as Dr. Llewellyn, and Don Diamond as Juan. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It.